Whether you're listening on your favorite podcast app or watching on YouTube, welcome to the Lion's Roar podcast from the publishers of Lion's Roar magazine and Buddha Dharma, The Practitioner's Guide. I'm Sandra Hannibal. If you enjoy this episode, subscribe so you don't miss future interviews. Today, Editor-in-Chief Melvin McLeod talks with Shantam Seth, a teacher in the Plum Village tradition founded by Thich Nhat Hanh, who leads pilgrimages to sacred sites throughout Asia, including two offered this year in partnership with Lion's Roar. In this episode, they discuss Thich Nhat Hanh's own pilgrimage to India, how visiting the places where the Buddha lived brings him to life, and bringing Buddhism back to the country where it was born. In partnership with Shantam Seth's company, Eleven Directions, this year's Lion's Roar destinations include India and Vietnam. You can learn more at lionsroar.com slash pilgrimages. Now, their discussion. This episode is sponsored by St. John's College in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Learn more about the St. John's Master of Arts in Eastern Classics at sjc.edu slash lion. Hi, this is Melvin McLeod, the Editor-in-Chief of Lion's Roar. And it's my pleasure to be here today with Shantam Seth, who is a teacher in the Plum Village lineage of Thich Nhat Hanh, who leads um, pilgrimages and trips to uh, primarily, I think, to Buddhist countries and to Buddhist sites around the world. Um, most famously, uh, in the pilgrimage called In the Footsteps of the Buddha. Lion's Roar is really thrilled to be in partnership with Shantam doing these pilgrimages, which are, of, I think, great benefit to all who participate in them. So we'll talk mostly about that today. So thank you very much, for Shantam, for joining us. No, thank you for welcoming me into your office in uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia. Yeah. Um, so you're a, a longtime student of Thich Nhat Hanh's and teacher in the Plum Village tradition. And as I understand it, Thich Nhat Hanh himself, inspired you to begin to lead pilgrimages, particularly to India, of which you are a native, in fact, still live there, um, and gave you instructions on how to do that so it would be most beneficial to those who participated. So can you tell us a bit about how Thich Nhat Hanh um, inspired you to do these and what teachings he gave you about the best ways to undertake pilgrimages? No, thank you. I met Thich Nhat Hanh in 1987, and uh, then I wrote him a letter saying, would you like to come to India? And he just finished writing the book Old Path, White Clouds, and he wanted to come to India, and he asked me whether I would organize a pilgrimage for him. So I did that, and for 35 days we traveled together to all the significant sites associated with the Buddha. At the end of the journey, he said, I think this is something you should do every year, and you should take people with you. And what he'd already shown me was how to do the journey. He didn't really tell me, he just did it. And it was really a retreat on wheels. It is like a retreat, which we do in Plum Village, but we moved every three days, or every four days. And it was a, a structure of both an external exposure to the sites associated with the Buddha, where he was born, where he died, where he uh, you know, gained awakening, where he gave his first teachings, but also an internal journey of sharing in the Dharma, uh, reading sutras, understanding the life story of the Buddha, and then internalizing that by seeing what is coming up for us in terms of uh, the teachings and how we can internalize that uh, to understand who the man was, uh, the, the historical Buddha. So I think the Buddha was, what, the, what Thich Nhat Hanh did for me was really bring the humanity of the Buddha to me. Uh, until that time, I'd been brought up in that area, but I used to go to these sites as a child, but the Buddha was always some sort of God. He wasn't really a human being. And I think Pai said, or Thich Nhat Hanh said, please uh, do this and you know, do this as a practice for, and bring other people with you. So I've been with really many times. I've traveled a lot around the world. And I can say that in my opinion, there is no more exciting, exotic, interesting, frustrating, transformative place in the world to go than India. I personally, for me, it is the number one tourist place in the world. So no matter what, Going to India with you on your tours, just for that alone, would be of great value and fascination. I have no doubt, particularly for those who've never been to India. But on top of that, there is the particular element of pilgrimage, presumably of most value to those who consider themselves Buddhists. So 
what would you say for a practitioner who goes on these tours to India or just goes on their own to these famous sites is the distinct quality and benefit of going to these sites that are can deeply connected with the Buddha's life and the early development of Buddhism. What is the value of, of, of that to us uh, spiritually? Yeah, no, you're right. India is all those uh, frustrating, beautiful, etc. And uh, I always think India is a great teacher. And so what we are seeing is India through the lens of the Buddha Dharma. And that is a great lens where we can see both our own suffering, the suffering of others, we can see the transformation that takes place within ourselves and in the society outside. And the pilgrimage um, allows us to have a much more a nuanced journey. It's uh, where we are not just getting caught in the exotica, but really looking at how it's impacting us. Uh, when, we, uh, when we get bombarded by all our senses get bombarded in India, as you know, whether it's what we see or hear, then how do we make sense of it? And, respond appropriately. So I think to actually travel as a community is very important, where we discuss with each other, like a Sangha as a community, um, you know, what is it that's impacting us? And then we start realizing that we're actually uh, traveling as a little organism of 15 pairs of eyes and 15 pairs of ears, and each person's happiness is our happiness, each person's suffering is our suffering, and we can create a practice space where we go. We, we create the Dharma Hall as a community. That allows us to really uh, deepen into the teachings. When we read the sutras at those places, when we discuss those things, what is the Buddha doing, it's important. And then we start seeing the, the context of his teachings. You know, when he talks about the, uh, seeing the sunset at Vulture Peak, you know, tells Anand, let's go and watch the beautiful sunset at Vulture Peak. What is that sunset? Of course, he was the sunset is still happening and you know it's you can I mean, it brings tears to your eyes when you watch it and you in that context of saying the buddha is watching the sunset too he was watching the, the sunset in, in the present moment can we really have those buddha eyes can we open our eyes to, to that extent and then we walk exactly where he walked and can we really walk with the feet the buddha walked and that is the sort of teaching which Thich Nhat Hanh taught me you know the walking meditation that you bring each you bring your attention and your mindfulness with every step and you come back into the present with every step. And that's what the Buddha was doing. So what we're doing is not just walking in the footsteps of somebody 2,600 years ago, but really trying to bring that teaching alive in ourselves as a community of travelers and pilgrims. And one of the ways in which that is most real is by recognizing that the Buddha and his experiences and his realizations were the experiences of a human being like us. Yeah. And, you know, as you said, when you were a child, you may have looked upon the Buddha as some form of God. Even for those of us who may take a view which is not totally mythological of the Buddha, it's pretty hard not to think of him as some sort of legendary or mythological symbolic figure. And I think that one of the things that can be most powerful in mean, experience of going to places like Bodh Gaya, Vulture's Peak, whatever, is you is the transformative sense of like that Buddha, that human being, the Buddha, walked in this very place. Mm -hmm. And I, you said something interesting in a piece you wrote for us um, that really struck me. It's that you can have many of those same experiences if you see a beggar in, and in fact, <laughs> we know those pilgrimage places are full of beggars, that the Buddha himself would have seen beggars in his day. That uh, that the Buddha himself might see a young peasant girl who might offer him a drink of something. And we that might happen to us too. And so not only are we in the same place, we in fact could even have, since much of India is even largely unchanged it's since in the 2,600 years since the Buddha lived, we might have very similar experiences to what he had. And that tends to humanize and make the Buddha much realer for yeah. us. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. And I think that's, India is an interesting place like that, where we live in different uh, generations or different time spaces yeah. uh, across 2,600 years, uh, where we see the plowing being done exactly as the Buddha saw it when he was a nine-year-old boy, where this girl Sujata, as you say, is still there in the village. 
where the boy is cutting the kusa grass and he's still cutting it with the sickle, which is probably not very different to the sickle when, um, when the Buddha was around. Um, so, uh, so I think the, 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 that sort of context is wonderful. But, you know, when we sit in a cave and we breathe with the Buddha, it's a small space. And he said, you know, the Buddha was breathing here. I'm breathing here. And so you sort of, in a way, transcend time. Um, and, and I think it's a sort of a, uh, there are lots and lots of aha moments. You know, you sit under the tree and, the, you know, under the Bodhi tree and you suddenly see there's a whole community of Buddhists, Japanese, Koreans, uh, you know, Singhali, uh, Singhali, uh, Sri Lankans and others, uh, Vajrayana Buddhists, all doing their thing. And it, it's a sort of cacophony, but in total harmony. And you think, oh, this is my community. This is also a recognition. You don't see it anywhere else. You might go to a, a, a Buddhist temple in, in, in Sri Lanka where you see Sri Lankan Buddhism. But here, on the Buddhist sites, you see the culture of Buddhism and how it's manifested. And what is it? It's very, very different cultures. But the Buddha's teachings are core. The awareness of our suffering, how to transform that suffering, to understand that, and how to live a happy and peaceful life. And everyone wants that. St. John's College in Santa Fe, New Mexico, is for undergraduate and graduate students who seek a lifelong commitment to thoughtful, collaborative inquiry into fundamental human questions. Graduate students pursuing the Master of Arts in Eastern Classics examine the core literary, philosophical, and theological works of India, China, and Japan. In small, discussion-based classes, students delve into the richness of Asian traditions and study one of two languages, classical Chinese, or Sanskrit. The three-semester Eastern Classics program offers the flexibility of both online and on-campus options. Learn more about the St. John's Master of Arts in Eastern Classics at sjc.edu slash lion. When you had that first experience of um, leading a pilgrimage for Thich Nhat Hanh himself, yes. um, after he had just published a book about the life of the Buddha. Were there any particular moments or experiences during that visit where you saw Thich Nhat Hanh deeply affected by the experience of being there? Yes, many. I mean, you know, I mean, Rajgir was somewhere he loved. When we did the itinerary, uh, he said, I'd like to spend five days there. And people I said, no, since five days there. He'd go before sunrise to Vulture Peak, spend the whole day till after sunset, put up his hammock, we'd have meals there. It was just living with the Buddha from morning to night. Uh, he, I remember once with a beggar woman, uh, the, a, a beggar child came, and uh, he was, she was going, eh, and he just held her hand and told me, hold the other hand. And this hand just loosened up after a little while, and we just walked. And uh, then this beggar kid with her, her brother and sister all had lunch together. We just sat together. And this, this beggar girl became a friend of mine. I then visited her family, her grandfather, and everyone like that. And, you know, he, he, there were so many. I, I remember sitting again, on, on the, we were on the journey, and I asked him, um, I, I used to wear a turban at the time. And he said, Shantam, he just sat and he was holding my hand. And he said, Shantam, you know, the issue of birth and death is as serious, as urgent as if your turban is on fire. You know, so things like this. He was. He also said on Vulture Peak. He said, "This is where my Buddha eyes opened." So he was. Actually, when you read Old Path White Clouds, you can see that he's really living the Buddha's life. He's like as if he's with him. And uh, and at that time, he was very keen. I became a monk. He actually shaved my head uh, in Kushinagar. I had a big beard and long hair, and, and, and gave me a robe. And uh, but. Yeah, also, I remember on the last day on the journey, we, we did a retreat and uh, we were heading to the airport. And I said, Thai, we can go at a certain time. He said, no, no, let's go uh, earlier, three or four hours earlier. And I said, we have enough time. And actually, as we left this place, the whole road had been dug up and um, because they were laying a new railway track and we, we got stuck there for four hours, three, four hours. And he just said, uh, so I, I don't know, little, little things which I get reminded of of his way of just being so present, and he loved India. He was like a child, actually. He just loved India. He was uh, so happy. And when he came again in uh, 1997, again in 2008, uh, we had 
we had amazing, uh, not just pilgrimages, but also he came to teach. And that was very significant too. I completely understand. I don't think... I'm often at my happiest in India, to be yeah. fair. I understand that completely. Of the various places on, in, the, in India and the Buddhist pilgrimage places that you go to, obviously Bodh Gaya, the seat of the Buddha's enlightenment, Rajgir, where he yeah. said to have preached the Heart Sutra, the teachings on emptiness, uh, Deer Park, the very first place where he taught yes. the first turning of the wheel of the Four Noble Truths, Lumbini, where he was born. Which of those places do you yourself like the most or are most moved by? Interesting question. Because, because I, I've been more than 100 times now, 100 times, and I find that the different places are different pilgrimages that touch me more deeply. But I would say if I had to choose one or two places, I would say Rajgir definitely has a very strong significance for me because there are caves, there's a little hill, there's the hot springs, uh, there's the first land given to the Buddha. I, I'm interested in the politics of the time. So Rajgir would be one, and I would say uh, 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 Shravasti. Shravasti, where he spent 24 of his rain retreats, so sitting in the park, the Jetta Grove, where the Buddha gave his teachings on the full awareness of breathing, and more teachings there than anywhere else. Uh, for me, those are very significant places. They're not one of the four places that the Buddha suggested. In the Mahaparinirvana Sutra, he says, you know, visit the place of birth, passing away, etc., and the awakening and first teaching. But these two places really do move me a lot. Uh, but I just feel so grateful I can go on this journey every time. And that's why when people come, I thank them. I said, you're coming so I can go. You know? Well, I too actually really like the Vulture Speak at Rajgir, although yeah. I would have to say that the thing that always is <laughs> stuck with me the most was that there's a chairlift going to the top of it. And as a former skier, I always found that rather anomalous. <laughs> yeah. Um, so... Uh, the chairlift actually doesn't go to Vulture Peak. It goes to Chatta Hill, which is on the side. I see. So luckily, we, we, we don't get disturbed by that. I think that's good. Um, so you also um, teach in, in Dharma in general, as you do are in, on this very trip you're on now in the West, in, in North America, Canada, but also in India. And um, as we know, the vast majority of those Buddhists who are in India, which is a very tiny minority, or either in the greater Tibetan cultural sphere in the Himalayas or, or Ambikar Buddhists in the Ambikar movement who are become Buddhists in order to escape the injustices of the caste system, which of course Buddhism doesn't recognize. And then you are there um, coming from the point of view of a Vietnamese Zen master which seems not fundamentally also noting of course as we've been saying that india indeed is the birthplace of buddhism as the president of the buddha himself so coming from that later mahayana tradition from a country with not that much connection or communication with what that is to say vietnam with india seems like a stretch on the other hand i think you could say that the Thich Nhat Hanh's teaching with their strong emphasis on mindfulness, on compassion, on engagement with the injustices of society, always extremely relevant in India, that many of his teachings, in spite of the fact that the tradition from which he comes is not something with any kind of Indian roots, would seem to me to ultimately be able to be of interest and importance in India. What do you feel it might be the potential of Thich Nhat Hanh's view, or we could even say a more modern international view of Buddhism, that, that it might actually end up being of interest and, and, and benefit to a significant number of Indians? Yeah, so it's interesting. When I met Thich Nhat Hanh in 87, one of the things he said to me that was try and bring the Buddha Dharma back to India. And that's a bit been my koan for the last 35 years. And we've tried to do it in many, many ways uh, through bringing mindfulness to school education, uh, working with the police. But with the Ambedkar community, I really feel uh, we, have, uh, we have a huge potential. And I think it's because uh, Thich Nhat Hanh speaks to them. Um, unlike 
many other teachers, he is not so caught up with this past life uh, rebirth model, which you know, which has, uh, which they don't want to hear because of the you know the whole idea of the atma and, the, and they're being dalits because of some past life karma. So I think that speaks to them. His books are we've translated his books into Marathi, uh, Hindi, many languages, which are, and they're very very popular amongst this community. And we do retreats with them from time to time. We just I just uh, two weeks ago we had a retreat of about 90, 80 or 90 young people mainly from the Dalit community, but also young Shakyas. And we're doing this sort of retreats. And what you're finding with this community is interesting. When, when Thich Nhat Hanh came, he, gave a, he did a retreat of 5,000 Dalits in Nagpur. He gave a talk to 250,000 250, Dalits. It was a big gathering of Dalits who had come because of the commemoration of Ambedkar's conversion. But what I'm finding now is there's a second generation, a third generation, who've come out of the struggle, who've had some affirmative action, and now are getting more and more interested in the Dhamma. This community of young people between the age of 18 to 25, 30, are very important now. Uh, and they're really interested in the Dhamma, and Thich Nhat Hanh's approach of engagement, of, uh, and, and even just the practice of walking, etc., and you know, deep, uh, deep listening, very important. So I think I, I can see that happening. I see we work quite closely with some of these communities now. Uh, we have a trust called Ahimsa Trust, which actually represents the Khan in India. And a lot of our work is about how to bring the Dharma back to India. And uh, we work both with the middle classes. We think there's a lot of intellectual interest uh, because people are, are skept- have a skeptical or I would say a scientific bent of mind because of our education. But amongst the Dalits, especially the Buddhist Dalits, they are really interested in, in now in, interested in what is the Dharma. And just so I understand what you're saying about the younger generation, and I, for those who may not be as familiar, the Dalits were who used to be known as in English as the untouchables, yes. therefore the lowest of the castes in India. And their situation clearly has improved. Obviously, there's been a lot of anti-caste uh, legislation, as well as uh, significant uh, affirmative action. Yeah. And so presumably, you're ending up with much more and a much more educated generation that start to come out of the, the previous levels of oppression. And so are, are, what, are you saying that that they may be Dalits who, whose parents were Buddhists, who became Buddhists primarily to escape the, the caste system, now that they've to a certain extent started to evolve past the injustices or restrictions of the caste system, that that's a particular demographic that you feel has an interest in going deeper into the Buddhism that perhaps their parents were primarily interested in as an escape from their social situation. Correct, because when, the, when, when Ambedkar interprets the cause of suffering, he talks about the economic, social, and political conditions creating your suffering, exactly. not the internal angst and the mind. Exactly. And now the educated young people from who have some affirmative action are interested in this. And that's our job, that's our, our duty, actually working with these people and uh, I really feel the greatest wisdom culture of India has been the Buddha Dharma and here 200 million people literally I mean potential Dalits uh, I mean right now we have say a population of say 8, 10 people say 8, 10, 15 million uh, Buddhists but I think that's because of uh, the census but I would say there's more like 25 million but the potential is 200 million so I think uh, but it's not just I'm not really into conversion, and you know that doesn't that doesn't interest me at all. I didn't interest Thich Nhat Hanh. We all, as we say, you know, full of non-Buddhist elements. But I, for me, it's that I really feel that the Buddha Dharma is the is the wisest teachings of, of the Indian culture. And how can we lose it? We we lost it effectively from the eighth, ninth century onwards. For a thousand years, we you know it's just dis- dissolved. And because of Ambedkar in 1956, he embraces Buddhism and. And that's where we find about 97% of the Buddhist population. On the other side, you find that Tibetans have been in India, and the finest teachers of the Tibetan community have been in India for now 60, 70 years. But somehow it hasn't penetrated. So that's why I found that the Thich Nhat Hanh teachings, there is that uh, uh, ability to, to, to bring it into the community. Yes, they're far more universal than the rather culturally yeah, I uh, think. confined as well as rather esoteric mystical traditions of Tibetan Vajrayana. I mean, yeah. Thich Nhat Hanh's teachings are 
And I think the emphasis there on, on past life, future life, doesn't go down well. Well, no, that's, the, that, that's, the one, that, that's been the ju theological justification for their repression, even though the Buddhist view is not the same, but on the yes. surface, it appears to be. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for, for joining us, yeah. Shantam. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you in person, finally. I, I, you have really interested me in, in I, mean, I would love to go back to India, of course, and uh, to go and uh, to, to go on one of your tours that was just terrific. Uh, your partnership with Lions Roar has been has been marvelous for us, and it's been marvel meeting you. And um, I'm sure that our listeners here, our viewers, have enjoyed what you said as well. So thank you very much. And I'm Melvin McLeod. I'm the editor in chief of Lions Roar. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Mission-driven, nonprofit, and community-supported, Lion's Roar offers Buddhist teachings, news, and perspectives so that the understanding and practice of Buddhism flourish in today's world, and its timeless wisdom is accessible. Go to lionsroar.com to subscribe and get unlimited access to online articles, new magazine issues, and several collections, plus perks and exclusives from Lion's Roar magazine and Buddha Dharma, the Practitioner's Guide.